too late. And I want you all to be in prayer for Miss Wilma Thalmar. It's not looking really good right now. I think they're going to turn the oxygen off today. So be in prayer for them. Also be in prayer for Chad and Malena. I actually hope they're sleeping right now, right? Getting rest. Traveler's grace for them. Any other announcements? Did I miss anything? All right, if y'all will stand, I will pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today, Lord. I am so thankful for yet another day that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy, Lord. We take it for granted, Lord. And I just pray right now that we open up our minds and our hearts today, Lord, to be in tune to you, to listen to what you have to say, Lord. I thank you right now for the praise team, Lord. And I just pray for anointment upon them today, Lord. I just ask that your spirit be upon them. Lord, I lift up Brother Danny as he's going to bring the message, Lord, and I pray that your words will come out. Lord, it's my prayer that someone will come to know you if they don't know you, Lord. I just lift that up to you right now, Lord. I do lift up Chad and Malena to you, Lord, and I, I pray for traveler's grace for them. I pray that you rejuvenate them, Lord, that you give them more energy. Lord, I lift up the Falmar family to you, Lord, and I just ask right now that you wrap your arms around them and that you comfort them like only you can, Lord. Lord, I just ask for blessings in this church for the team kids. I just pray that you bring kids here, Lord, and I pray that they come to know you, Lord. I ask that you bring workers as well, Lord, with a joyful spirit and want to teach about you. Lord, I love you. I love this church. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we... <clears throat> We want you to join in with us. It's a blessing to be here to be able to sing and praise God. And there's so many things happening and so many things we uh, need comfort for. And, and God can comfort us. And we need that. And he knows that. He loves us. Footsteps of Jesus. Join in with us as we sing. It'll be on the screen. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling, lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever we go. Though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountains, seeking his sheep, or along by the Lord's fountains, helping the that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Then at last when on high he sees us our journey done. We will rest where the steps of Jesus in that his throne. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. All right, if you would be seated for a few minutes, we're going to see a video.
to see what the Lord is going to do moving forward as we transition on this side. Church Builders is a group of men, volunteer men. We go and we perform construction, new construction for churches. Uh, we do stuff for ministries that are Christ centered. Uh, we build houses, we build all kind of things, and we build inside and out of buildings. We build the framing in there. We'll build a, from the foundation up with, with wood building. Uh, we build all kind of things, and we usually go and spend two weeks at a time and build as much as we possibly can. And what we're moving into here is a 6,000 square foot facility that's going to have classrooms in it. It's got big, large bathrooms. Uh, we're actually putting a baptistry in for them that they've never had before. Uh, so we're we're changing them from an old antique building into a new modern uh, Baptist church with all the amenities and all the things that they'll need to keep moving the ministry forward to help win people for Christ. This is this building is going to help them have room to reach out, to expand, to grow, to have facilities, to have uh, projects and things for their children and the youth in the community and that they've just never had before. So. It's all about, remember, it's all about reaching people for Christ, and that's exactly what this building is gonna help them do. And man, what an exciting time to be a part of that. Take anybody that's that's willing, that wants to work, that has a good attitude, and wants to be a part of something that's bigger than us. We'll help train you to learn how to do something. And by the time you're through with us for two weeks, you'll know how to do framing. And you may know how to do electrical. Words of gratitude, words of thanks cannot describe what they did for us you can see now what they have done for us they set us a whole lot of money that we didn't have and so we just thank the law for the ministry thank the law for what they have done amen i would like to mention that uh we have several we have a couple of men that are involved in texas uh the Texas Builders, Texas Baptist Men is what it's called, I believe. I'm looking for Jerry. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, and then uh, when Mike Miller, wherever Mike is, oh, he's in the back. Uh, they, uh, when he came in, he got in, him involved as well. And let me just read uh, a couple of things. If I didn't, here we go. Let me couple, read a couple of things that came out this morning uh, uh, from Texas Baptist Men. God is transforming lives through Texas Men Ministries. Last year, more than 300 people came to faith in Christ as a result of TBM volunteers sharing God's love. That's directly. Uh, this year, uh, TBM volunteers have delivered help, hope, and healing in more than 30 Texas locations after disasters. They do disaster relief. Uh, TBM has drilled water wells around the globe that are changing the lives of generations. Young men have come to faith and grown in it through royal ambassador programs and camps that they support and refurbish and do different things at. TBM volunteers have expanded the ministries of churches and camps across the state and even across state lines. We had a, I had a friend that uh, in Kansas, they had a church that seated about 120 and they were running about 175. They finally put together a building program, and uh, Texas Baptist men actually came up there and helped them put up a million-dollar building that seated 300, and the opening service of that service, they had 275, and they have had 300. And so Texas Baptist men have, are well-known everywhere for what they do, and we just wanted to highlight them this morning. Thanks. Well, there was a discussion in Sunday school class whether I could walk up the steps twice. And I made it. <laughs> so we did. Hey, would you join in with us as we continue our song service? I am resolved no longer to linger. We're so thankful for our pianist today. I, a lot of you didn't know that she could play the piano. We're so thankful for her to doing this. You didn't she want said, me to do I, that, did you? You didn't want me to do that, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's sing. <clears throat> I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him. Hey. 
made sun so glad and free. Jesus, greatest highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He saith, do what He willeth, He is the living way. So glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit. We'll walk the heavenly way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. The old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a cross, I will let be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory for so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophy. 
trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a Jim will go to come and sing for us during our offertory. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our heart for the ability to come to your house and rejoice in knowing you as our Father and, and having faith. Lord, we love you. And we just ask that you take these tithes and offerings that's offered up and use them to further your kingdom and to do the things that's pleasing to you. Lord, be with us. Be with those on our prayer list, wherever they're at. Be with those that are sick, those that need your, your care and, and salvation, Lord. We just pray that you put your, your kind, gentle hand on, on all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have a lot of changes happening in our church. Uh, Dana's gone, and we were actually going to sing this song for her, and of course now she's not here. And I think Sonia's moving. Is it someone else moving to Conroe? Yes, and So there's lots of things, but this song gives comfort. Downtown there's a fire at the shopping mall a picture of a daughter hangs in view Somehow she went missing about a year ago Maybe someone somewhere has good news and Lord, I was reminded of a picture of your saving love there's no one missing when they're with you. There's no missing people up in heaven. There's no leaving loved ones like before. Everyone is finally home forever. Death can't separate anymore I won't be missing you you won't be missing me but there's no missing people I'll be maybe you've been grieving for a lost and if you could be granted just one wish You would ask for one more day to hold them And cross that lonely feeling off your list Thank God we know where they are Your mind drifts back beyond those stars to the place where they will not be missed There's no missing people up in heaven There's no leaving loved ones like before Everyone is finally home forever 
separate us anymore I won't be missing you You won't be missing me But there's no missing people I won't be missing you And you won't be missing me up in heaven There's no missing people up in heaven There's no living loved ones like before Everyone is finally home forever And death can't separate us anymore I won't be missing you You won't be missing me Cause there's no missing people Up in heaven There's no missing people Up in enjoy uh, Irwin singing. Very good. I'm going to have to look at the mall next week and find out if uh, Dana's picture is in there. <laughs> All right. Good. Although she'll be back next week. She'll be back next week. One, one more time with the frogs. I, one more night with the frogs. Right? <laughs> Uh, I forgot to mention, there are some uh, magazines in the back uh, from TBM Today, and there's a really ugly guy on page whatever this is, page two, page three, there's an ugly guy running a router, uh, it looks a lot like Mike Miller, so anyway, you might want to check that out, uh, can't imagine Jerry does all the work, and Mike gets all the credit. Now, he's not, I, can't, I can't do that. He's not here, so I can't, can't give him a hard time. Uh, okay. Seemed like, oh, I know one more thing. I want to make one more push uh, for this Saturday is the Blitz. Remember, we did a VBS Blitz, and we had a great turnout. And we haven't, you know, maybe, maybe said quite as much, but please, this Saturday, 10 o'clock, we're going to... Have uh, we'll have either where if you want to go to one of the trailer parks or if you want to have names to go to from VBS kids or previous kids, we'll have all of that laid out for you to be able to make some contacts. We'll have some cards to be able to deliver to the homes, tell them about Wednesday night stuff, and try to get the Wednesday night activities kicked off. And so if you could help us do that, that would really, really, really be beneficial and that was just a great success. And afterwards, we're going to have brisket. Yeah, okay, we'll have some brisket afterwards. So uh, anyway, so when you get done, you know, you can go make one call, pretend they weren't there, come on back and eat with us. So, you know, I know, I know how it works. I know how it works. Okay. Okay. Uh, One advantage of being a pastor, you can say what you want to, at least for one week, or do what you want to before, you know, maybe the next week you get fired. But, you know, don't you hate it when people show pictures of their vacation? Aren't those really, really boring? Uh, uh Uh-oh. Keith, can you start my, my click, and then I can take care of it from there, I think. Here we go, here we go, here we go, Colorado, and let's see, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to roll all by itself now. So you can observe one of our Colorado trips, it uh, wasn't too long before we came back to Texas, and we were allowed to stay in a, a member of our church, had a condo in Dillon, Colorado, about 
10 miles from Breckenridge. And uh, it's about eight or nine, uh, maybe 9,000 feet high, I think, where that was. And, and we were guests, and we were honored to be allowed to use their special condo. I could never afford a condo like that in uh, Dillon, Colorado, but they welcomed us, and so we finally took them up on it, and we went. And each day, you know, you could get some of this were around, somewhere around that area. Some of them, the early, uh, earlier pictures, you could actually look off the balcony and see the peak fall colors. I did not know aspen, some aspen turn red. But they do. There's, it, it depends on the variety. But they were yellows and brilliant yellows, brilliant red. It was absolutely amazing. And we, you know, we went various places from there. Went across some passes, you know, dirt road passes, and all of that stuff. And and so it was just marvelous time. And every night we'd return to the condo, and it was peaceful, and you renew and relax. Now I won't tell you about the the the. Uh, the altitude sickness I had the first couple of days. We won't go there. But, but we had a great, great time. Uh, now, when we were there, we didn't repaint the place. We didn't do any remodeling. We didn't try to make it different or knock down a wall. It wasn't ours. We merely were guests enjoying someone else's things. So we uh, had a great deal of respect for the place. And we did... The things we, they asked us to do, the responsibilities we had, they said, you can use our place, but now push the button so it, you know, one of those automatic uh, um, shower cleaner thingy, daily shower cleaner things. So they'd say, you know, push the button, and then the last one that showers, squeegee it down. Didn't have a problem. Uh, when, you're, when you're done at the end of the week, vacuum the floors. Uh, and I, and I think, I'm not absolutely sure, maybe we did the bedding and the towels and gathered that kind of stuff up. And so, I mean, these were things, you know. We had some responsibilities. But boy, we were having a great time, and it, and it just wasn't a problem. In fact, we didn't enjoy ourselves so much that we forgot the responsibilities that came with enjoying the place, right? Well, you know, you, you get out there, well, we don't have time to do this. We don't have time to do the floor. We're going to let the shower stink. We're going to, you know, no, we just, we respected it, and we had a great time. And by the way, at the end of the stay, now, they just ha happened to be in the area. I mean, eight hours away. They, they had some kind of a, a meeting or something. They didn't come and check on us, but... They came by and stopped, and we rejoiced together, and, and we were able to enjoy their generosity and their love they showed for us, and, and you know, they could take a look around and make sure that we did all the things. So it was a, a genuinely... Good. Now, by the way, wouldn't that have been terrible if we had to track mud all over the house and ripped the, the, the couches and just done whatever we wanted to do and, and act like a bunch of teenagers and, you know, and, and, and just left it a mess? That would not have been a very good, but it was a good relationship. We did what we were asked to do and enjoyed our time. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. And that's called stewardship. When you're given something and it's somebody else's and you take care of it and you do the responsibilities associated with that, that's called stewardship. And that's actually a pretty good description of the Christian life. We've, given, we've been given all these things to enjoy, but they're not ours. They're His. And He's given them to us to use, to invest, to manage for Him. To fulfill our, our responsibilities while we enjoy the journey. And the result is when properly executed and enhanced relationship. We appreciate what He's done for us. And He is pleased with us fulfilling the responsibilities He's given to us. So that's what we want to talk about today. And, and we'll actually be talking to this theme of stewardship. It, it, it's more than, you know, we immediately when we talk about stewardship, we think financial, and it is financial. But it's much more than that. It's a life. Everything I have today, 
uh, David and I were talking about how blessed we are as a nation. And we complain, and, and we do, and, 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 you know, and, and there's issues, and there's stuff. But what a great place God has given us, even in the midst of some of the chaos and uncertainty. What a great place God has given us. How wealthy He has provided for us. I don't know of anybody here that is homeless. Or, and as I look around, too many of you all that look like you're underfed. God has provided. And it's all His. Isn't it reasonable that we should use it for Him? That's called stewardship. And so I want us to talk some about stewardship. And today we're going to be talking about be called to stewardship. What does it mean? Properly handling of God's things. Kind of a, a snapshot. And then we'll look at some other passages in other weeks. Father, we invite you now to speak to our hearts. You've provided so abundantly for us in every possible way. And we are yours. And everything we have is yours. Our life is yours. Our time is yours. The way you've engineered us to serve you is yours. Our money is yours. Everything about us is yours. And Lord, you give it to us freely to enjoy and to reinvest for you. May we take every part of our life and ensure you get the glory out of it. Lord, may we invest in the kingdom. And Lord, may we be good stewards. And Lord, if somebody is here today that without you, may they recognize, even as we talk, what a wonderful thing it is to know the Lord of the universe, to have our sins forgiven, and to have heaven as our inheritance and all things that you've provided. And Lord, may they desire, desire you. May they desire to come and trust you as Savior and enter into a relationship with you that will last forever, that is abundant and meaningful. Now, Lord, bless, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Proper, properly handling God's things. Definition of stewardship. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he begins like this. This is how one should regard us as servants of God and as stewards of the mystery of God. So he, he summarizes how he would want to be viewed. Stewardship is about being a servant. You should regard us as servants of Christ. Now, the whole discussion here is, a, is, is actually been in the context of, you know, we've got this faction, we've got the Bob faction over here. And we're following Bob. And we have the, we have the, the Benny faction over there. And everybody's following Benny. And then, of course, you have the Reed faction over here. And then you have the Christ faction. You know, the really super spiritual ones. And so, factions in the church. And so, that, that's kind of an overall thing. Disunity, grumbling, discontent. Division, that's the overall context. And Paul says, no, you should regard us as servants of Christ. Not a sense of pride, but as a servant. In fact, this particular use of the word servant isn't doulos, which is the normal. A lot of times you see that word servant, uh, you know, being like an indentured slave kind of a thing. This word is, is under rower as I'm under the authority of Christ. And everything about my life is under His authority. And Paul says, I want people to look at me and go, now there's a guy that every part of his life shows that he is under the authority of Christ and serves Christ. If, that, if, if I looked at how he spent his time, I would say, wow, we're going to, if Nero was having court and going to convict the Christians that 
Where do they spend their time? Is it in the kingdom? Is it for Christ? Or is it frivolous and for themselves only? Paul says, I want them to, to look at me and see that I spend my time for Christ. I, I serve Christ, that He is important. If you looked at my talents, am I using them for Him? Now, here's the reality, and, 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 and we'll actually touch on this in a different message. God has gifted you. Yes, yes, yes. Paul, God has gifted you uniquely. And I would argue, and I do argue, that that began at birth with your parents, your experiences, your, you know, how you were raised, all of the things about you. He superintended. And then when you got saved, He endowed you with a spiritual gift that says, when I'm doing this, God seems to do something radically supernatural. It's beyond my ability that God is doing something. That God is, is at work in your life, gifting you. Are you gift, using those gifts for God? Paul says, I want them, when people see me, I want them to see somebody who is pouring out how God has wired me for the kingdom. We'll use the M word, the money word. Includes that. How am I spending? If I looked at my checkbook, could I see that I'm a Christian? Paul says, if you looked at my checkbook, I have, in fact, Paul gave up the, 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 the position as you know, a major Pharisee and all that would entail, and he gave it all up in order to serve Christ, dedicating himself, later spending his money on things of Christ. In fact, he worked so he could do ministry. He didn't have to. He'll be, in fact, in, in Corinthians, he argues that. He said, now, you know, even the ox, you know, don't muzzle the ox. You need to pay your preacher. You need to pay your pastor, and you need to do that stuff. And he said, but I didn't because of the situation that I was in. I didn't want you to think that I was money grubbing. So he worked and reinvested his own money in his own ministry for Christ. That it's all totaled. If you looked at me, Paul said, I am under the authority of Christ, every part of not, you know, it, Paul didn't view it as, well, I'll give, I'll give Christ Sunday morning church. I'll come to church. Hey, what more can I do? That's, that's half a, half a, half a 1% of 1% or something. But I did my duty. No, no, Paul invested his life in the kingdom. He, he was under the authority of Christ in every way. And then he says, not only was I a servant, but I was, and this is the key word, a steward. And, and we want to flesh this word out. Stewards, especially of the mystery of God. Now, l hold on for a second, and we'll talk about steward meaning house manager, and it's bigger than just this. But here he says, I'm a steward of the mysteries of God. Here's the reality. God has revealed to me that Jesus came to die for sinners. So, the, so anybody who chooses Christ can come to know the Father, Jew, Gentile, anybody can come. Wow, this is great. This is amazing. This is something that wasn't fully understood until now. And, and, and now the message goes out. I'm, I'm a good steward. God has given me this precious gift, and I'm going to tell people about it. You know, so at least one of the elements of stewardship is going to involve sharing the truth of what God has done for us, specifically the mystery of God, Christ, that He came to die for sinners like me. And whoever will can have their sins forgiven and trust Christ. I can, I can go out on a Saturday and blitz the neighborhood and tell people about Christ, or at least invite them to a place where they will come and hear about Christ 
I want to be a steward. My life, I've been entrusted with this message. And I need to share it. You know, sometimes we, and, you know, and, and occasionally it comes up, well, it even comes up on Tuesday night sometimes. Well, well, what about those that haven't heard and the nations and so forth? And, you know, and we, and we can go, you know, and I think I can make a convincing case that, that only in Christ can people be saved. But, you know, our, our, our less of an issue for us are the people that are in some deserted island. More of an issue for us is our neighbor. They need Christ. And God's asked us to be a steward. We've been given the message of the gospel. And he says, be a steward of that. This is something that, that you're responsible to carry forward. And Paul says, I'm a steward of the mystery of God. A steward and a servant together. The, uh, the, the word steward there actually, and we'll flip back to Luke chapter 12 for a moment. Uh, as Jesus gives a couple of parables, and one of them in, in, in chapter 12, he says, The Lord said, Who then is a faithful and wise steward, manager, whom his master will set over his household? to give them their portion of the food at the proper time. And so, here's the same word, and it means a house manager. And what typically happened in the New Testament was, you know, you got some rich muckety-muck, and he's above trying to take care of his house. He's off spending the money, you know. He needs somebody to take care of the house, you know. So, he would take, perhaps, a servant and promote him to take care of all of his things. It's like Joseph with, uh, you know, in Egypt. The, you know, Potiphar uh, made him the house manager. And everything in the house was up to Joseph to do. Now, Joseph didn't own a thing of it. But he was to take care of it. And he was to invest it. He was to manage it well. And so, house manager. Think of, of, of somebody that's, got a condo and says, okay, you take care of my condo and then you can enjoy the benefits of it. That's what we are. There's not a thing that we own. It all belongs to Him. We were able to work and earn it because of His grace in our lives that gave us the jobs that enabled us to be healthy enough, gave us intelligence, did you know, gave us whatever we needed to do to be successful, but it was His hand at work, and His hand directly at work. You know, it all belongs to Him. You know, are there times in your life, and I can point to a number of them, some that just, bam, just stick right in my head, is crisis points. You know, I was on the way from one building to the other building in EDS, and the GM Board of Directors were there, and there was a presentation that my boss was supposed to do, and at the last minute he said, you're going to do it. And I know why he d did that, because he wanted to be sure if it failed, somebody else could take the blame. He was one of those kind of guys. And on the way, I had this conversation with God. And the result of that meeting and, and what flowed out of that was financial security for the rest of my life. That was a God thing. And it's true in the obvious and it's true in the non-obvious that everything belongs to Him and we're just managers of it. What if we had a vision that everything we had is His? How can I manage it for Him? That's exactly what stewardship is. That is exactly what stewardship is all about. Paul then goes on and says, after he says, I'm a servant and I'm a steward, he lays out just a, a couple of broad base things. I mean, there's much more to it than this, but he, he lays out some of the pro, the, a couple of the priority things. He says, moreover, you know, I'm a servant and I'm a steward. And he says, moreover, here, here, get this. It is required of stewards that they be found faithful. 
For me, this is one of the big issues related to just any decisions, you know, as a church, or it relates to personnel, it relates to positions, faithfulness. Uber talent isn't enough. In fact, because God is at work, He does produce people with great gifts, and they ought to be using their gifts. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is faithfulness. Paul says, it's required of stewards. I want to be found faithful, not a flash in the pan. Anybody can look good for the moment, right? Anybody can, can run 10 yards and, and call it good. But if it's a cross-country marathon, faithfulness is everything. To be faithful. The requirement of servant. The requirement of a good steward. Just to be faithful. And if we're faithful, God can adjust us. He can change us. He can help us to understand. But first of all, we have to be faithful. Does it matter? You know, you, know, you can immediately think of faithfulness in a whole realm of error. And, and the truth is, you know, God gives us direction. He gives us commands. He says, let's gather together. And sometimes we do. But are we faithful? Does it matter? And the answer is, of course it does. You know, uh, whether it's, uh, you name it. Am I faithful? Am I faithful? You know, anybody can give on the spur of the moment, and if you have a strong enough message and you feel, you know, weepy because of the message and the, the three orphans that are laying on the ground that is gonna, are going to starve to death, you know, anybody can do that for a moment. But, but are we faithful so that it's part of our lives? You know, better for worse, the end result the end reward, I think, at the coming of Christ will be faithfulness. And we'll find people that we didn't expect to be rewarded that are first. And the flash in the pan might be last. It's about faithfulness. I admire faithfulness over anything. Personally, I think that's what Paul's saying. It is required for faithful. And then he goes on and says, I have a clear conscience in his dealings with me as I deal with the master's things. Uh, 4 verse 3, but to me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I'm not aware, but even though I'm not aware of anything against myself. Now Paul said, best I know, best I know, I'm following Christ, but you know, I can be wrong. Because sin is so deeply interwoven. How much of what we do is because of us? You know, how much of me standing here preaching is because I enjoy people paying attention to me? When you do. Of getting self-gratification. And that's of no reward. Paul says, I, I'm going to be careful. I'm not going to let you judge me. I'm not going to let me judge me. But best I can, I'm going to have a clear conscience before God because I know that it is the Lord who judges me. He's the one that matters. And I stand ready to be evaluated by the Lord. Well, you know, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? If we could just say, I'm ready, best I can. I'm living faithfully. I'm seeking to be a good steward, knowing Christ is coming, and the Lord will judge when He comes. He goes on and says, therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. He'll bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and He'll disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation or condemnation from God when he comes. There was an old chick track, I think, 
and and I'm not sure that maybe they blew it out. You know, maybe it's kind of a, a wild thing. I, they're standing before the bema seat, and suddenly they're displayed for everybody and millions and billions of people. And here you you displayed the the inner parts of your heart. I, I don't know that that'll exact, but here's what he's saying. He's saying those things that are hidden that no one knows about will be exposed. And the reasons you do what you do will be exposed before the Bema Seed of Christ. Now, the, you know, the Bema Seed is, we, we were in, in Corinth, and it's probably twice as high as this, the, the Bema Seed in Corinth. And it was, you know, like a big platform, and then it drops off, and then the people would come to be judged before the magistrate. And then, you know, in fact, actually down in the corner, there's a whipping post. So if, you, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it right here in front of everybody. You know, so, I mean, it was kind of an interesting thing. But the judgment seat of Christ isn't for salvation. And in a way, it's not even for judgment. In a, in a negative sense, it's a, it's a judgment for reward. And Paul, in a different spot earlier in Corinthians, talks about everything about our life being exposed to fire. And then what survives? What we built upon the foundation of Christ. Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. And at the judgment seat of Christ, all of that stuff that was worthless, done for ourselves, about ourselves, burns up. And, and all that's left is how we've invested for the kingdom. And not just what we did, but based on the purposes of the heart. Is Christ the center of my life? Is he driving what I do? It's not a question, even earlier as I said, coming to church. Why do I come? Do I come because I want him to speak to me. I want to minister to other people. I want other people to minister to me. Well, what's going on in my heart as I do what I do? And when he comes, he'll expose it. Oh, Lord, help me today to yield to you so that, that I do the things a steward should do but I, and I do it for the right purposes so that when you come I'll hear the commendation from God well done good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the Lord you've served well in a few things I'll make you rulers over many things what a great thing for eternity. And to have the praise of God himself to say, yes, you are a steward. Among some things, enter into the joy of the Lord. It stands ready to be evaluated by the Lord. So let's look, just look at that quickly. We'll look at an example to flesh some of this out. Luke, uh, in, in Luke chapter 16 Jesus given a parable, and we won't look at the entire parable, but we're going to look at just the first and the last parts of it. We'll leave out the middle part. And he says in verse chapter 16, verse 1, he also said that the disciples, there was a rich man who had a house manager, a steward, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting, he wasn't a good house manager, he was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Make an account of your management, of your stewardship. And in fact, you're no longer going to be my steward. Accountability. You know, we, we live in a world where there is no accountability. But there is accountability. There is accountability before God, and there will be. And, and, and so here's, here as this begins to unfold, and as we talked about earlier, there is accountability. And here, even in this parable... The, the house manager is going to have to be accountable for his stewardship. Now, 
wasn't a very good steward, but he was pretty crafty. And, and so there's certain things out of this parable that will just draw the conclusion that Jesus drew without the details. And the master commanded the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. He managed to do some things that likely benefited the master as well as himself. But here's what he says. The sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it, all, when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. And, and, and we, won't, we don't have time to penetrate all and, and bring, but let me just bring you to the conclusion, which is a steward deals wisely with eternal purposes. And in this particular case, he's talking specifically about money. And so, a steward uses his money wisely for eternity. Now, it's not just that, but it definitely includes that. He deals wisely with eternal purposes. He shows faithfulness in small things. He goes on and says, One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. The principle that says a steward shows faithfulness in small things. You could argue that maybe money is one of those things in itself. Money is not a big deal to God, but it reflects the heart, how we deal with our money. But that's true in a dozens of different ways. If you're faithful in the little, you're faithful in the much. One who is dishonest in a very little is going to be dishonest in much because it's a character issue. You know, give me a, you know, a flashy job that'll get lots of attention and I'll do a great job. Give me a little meaningless, menial thing and I don't really care about that because it's about me. And Christ is saying, no, faithfulness is a character thing. A good steward, give me anything, and I will be faithful at it. And if you're faithful in the small, the big things take care of themselves, right? And if you're not faithful in the small, ultimately, even the big things, you'll become unfaithful. A steward shows faithfulness in the small things. And, going back even to the money thing, because you can't divorce it, demonstrates faithfulness in monetary things. If you then have been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, things that are, that are of, of, of no value, you know, wealth and, and, and money and all of that stuff that in, it, in the scheme of things is almost insignificant, if you're not faithful in those things, who are you, how will you be entrusted? True riches. Things that really matter. Money is part of maybe a small thing. But a good steward is faithful in monetary things. And you know, I don't like to talk about money. I, haven't, I don't know that I've, I don't know if I've preached about money at all since I've been here. Uh, but you know, at one level, money is, is inconsequential because God provides a need. But He provides the need through people, through faithful people that give. And, 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 you know, when you think about money, maybe it's not such a small thing. Money is what we spend most of our life earning. We work 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week most of our lives to get money. It reflects our life. Money is what we use to buy happiness, get satisfaction. The question is, where's our satisfaction? Where's our happiness? Money is our security. But who's really the one that has our security? And so you can, all, you can view, and I think you will do, money can become almost a god. And how we deal with our money reflects 
whether it is our God or whether God is our God. In fact, that's what he goes on and says uh, in a, here in a second. Uh, but he, first he says, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you what is your own? Again, goes back to faithfulness in what God has given. Then how are you going to benefit? And he doesn't exactly flesh this out here in other places he does. It goes back to give to get to give. And we'll see that in in. in Corinthians 8, when we get there. Um, not a health wealth thing where I want money, I want money, so I'm going to give some money, so I can have money. That's not what he's talking about. What he is talking about, though, and regularly says, is you give, God finds you faithful so that he can return, so you can give. You sow the seed, he returns it so you can give again. How powerful it is when you have someone so faithful that God can entrust riches to because they'll invest it in the kingdom as opposed to splurging on themselves. And my experience, by the way, is it truly is a case you can't outgive God. No, no. again, it's not a, I want to get, so I'm going to try to give a whole bunch. It's, I'm going to invest regardless. And God honors that. And that's been the story of our marriage for 40 years. And goes even beyond, before that is, and as a church, may we never stop mission giving if we have to cut all the staff and have a lay preacher. God blesses those that give at a church level, at an individual level, to be good stewards of what He's given us so that then He can give and we won't splurge it, but we'll use it for Him. Here's an improper example. The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed Jesus and said to him, you are the, and he said to them, uh, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. This is the reverse of everything we've just said. Pharisees, lovers of money, and you end up being opposing God justifying themselves. But God knows the heart. And God sees the heart. An improper example of a, non of a non-steward. The issue is really who you serve. And, and two thoughts and we're done. Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters. Either he's going to hate the one and love the other, or he's going to be devoted to one or he's, and despise the other. And be careful here, it says, you cannot serve God in money. He used this as an example. So he did it, I didn't, so you just have to deal with that. Basically, money can be, and often is, an idol. Other things can be idols too. And the reality is you can't serve God and anything else you got to decide. God won't take part-time. He doesn't want a part-time Christian. He wants someone that is life with their life, their steward of their life. That's what he wants. And you can't just piddle along with him. You can't serve God and anything else, including money. It's an issue of who you serve. And then finally, the real issue is the issue of the heart. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, we ought to be aware of ourselves. And we ought to look at ourselves every once in a while and go, where do I spend my time? Where do I spend my money? What do I get satisfaction out of? And evaluate to be sure that the answer to all of those questions ultimately is the Lord and not some false God. Because the thing you treasure, 
There's where your heart is. And Jesus wants our heart. Stewardship. Kind of got to start at talking about it. Um, where's your heart this morning? Maybe you don't know Jesus is your Savior. And you know, and the reason, by the way, preachers hate to even use the word money is because that's, you know, all the time. Well, all they ever do is talk about money. And we're not just talking about money. We are talking about money, but not just about money. We're talking about where's your heart. If our hearts are for Jesus, everything else takes care of itself as he teaches us. But first of all, where's your heart? You know, where, who's your God? And maybe you've never intentionally decided, I want Jesus as my Savior. And maybe that's the problem. Sometimes that's the problem in church members is we have all these issues and the reality is that we've never met and encountered the Lord Jesus and trusted Him personally. Had that conversation actually this week with a, a man up in Peerless uh, from the association, uh, deacon up there, and, and we had this conversation. We were talking about his wife, and I identified because my wife's the same way. Baptist for years and years and years and years and years and years. And then one day, there was a decision that said, you know, I know all about Jesus, but I've never trusted Him as my Savior. And his wife trusted Jesus. My wife trusted Jesus. Been years ago now, but she'd been Baptist forever and forever, but it was a question of the heart. Wasn't what she was doing. It was a question of the heart. Do you know Jesus is your Savior? Have you trusted Him? That's essential. Now, once you trust Him as Savior, then we allow Him to have control that everything we've got is His. And now we need to be good stewards of everything that He's given me. He gave me a great condo and I want to enjoy it and take care of it and, and use it. And, 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 and it's a fun time along the way. That's the Christian life. But we have to make a decision to, as a Christian, are we going to give Him everything? And that's what I'm asking you. Have you given Him all? So this morning, I ask you, however way God might be speaking to you, we invite you to make any kind of decision that He's calling you to make. Let's stand and, and, and let me pray. Father, I love you, Lord, and we, we, we love you, and we invite you to speak to hearts this morning. Draw us to you. Cause us, Lord, to allow you to be everything in our lives. Help us to be good stewards. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you sing with me? And if you need to make a decision, slip down here. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine, let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, do pray for the Fulmer family. She's not doing well in the hospital. And so uh, be praying for, for that family uh, as well. Okay?
Mike, uh, either Mike. Okay, Mike Smith, why don't you, Mike Smith. <laughs> Mike Miller. <laughs> you close us in prayer. <laughs> Father, we do thank you for today. We, we praise your name, Father, and just ask you to help us be good stewards of your, of your kingdom, Father. And Father, just put people in front of us that, and have us prepared to talk to them about you, Father, as we go about our week. Father, we do love you. We ask you for, to guide and lead us through our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.